I'm Jordan Belfort, and this is Sales School. All right, so if you're a business owner, do not let QuickBooks and spreadsheets slow you down anymore. Now is time to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud-based business system. NetSuite gives you the visibility and control over your financials, inventory, and more. Schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com slash school. And we're on what I think is probably one of the most important topics of all, prospecting. Now, if you've been through prospecting, maybe you have, I haven't, I don't know if you're close to getting through it, you're gonna notice it's one of the longest modules in the training and there's a reason for that. Because the biggest mistake that newbie salespeople make is they fail to realize that not only is prospecting about like you know you know building rapport and getting the person to kind of warmed up and you know finding out who can potentially buy right it's also about eliminating the ones that are not right for your product in other words when you're prospecting yeah of course you're looking to you know sift through a list that the marketing department gave you. So in other words, you have a marketing team. Every company you go to is gonna have some sort of marketing team. And in the, for the very few that don't, well, what's happening is you're doing both because it just makes sense for you because of the nature of the business that you're working for that you do two in one. But marketing, what it does basically is it brings in a list of potentially qualified buyers. The more targeted the marketing campaign, the more targeted the, this you know, this big list of buyers is going to be, right? But no matter how targeted a campaign is, no matter how much effort we put into it, you're never gonna be right 100% of the time. So if I run a marketing campaign that's heavily targeted, let's say I get 100 names of people that are interested in my products, honestly, at the high end, 50 might be right for my product. And 50, you're gonna be wrong for it. Either they just don't qualify, or maybe they would love to be able to qualify, they don't can't afford it or whatever, right? So in other words, you can't expect that if I give you a list of 100 or 1,000 names, and make no mistake, when you're on the phone calling, you're expected to make two, 300 calls a day. Why? Because you're sifting through a list of semi-qualified people, meaning they might be right for your program or product, and your goal is to separate out the ones who actually are close enough to being right for it that they are almost worth making a presentation to. In other words, what you don't wanna do is make a full-blown sales presentation to someone who has no shot of buying your product. Why? You waste your time, you waste their time, so there's a time management issue, but just as important, at the end of the day, let's say you spoke to 10 people and eight of them were just not qualified, but you presented to all 10 of them. So what happens? Well, obviously the most you could possibly close is two. Eight were not right for your product. They just either didn't want it, didn't need it, or couldn't afford it, right? So at the end of the day, what do you say to yourself? Oh God, maybe I'm just not good at selling. I mean, I made 10 pitches and then no, and then, and then one out of 10 bought it from me. Meanwhile, the reality is your closing rate is 50%. In other words, if you had two people that were qualified that could buy and one bought, your close rate really is 50%, but because you made presentations to people you should not be speaking to, you think you're doing badly. I can't tell you how many salespeople I have seen make this mistake in companies all over the world, and as soon as I teach them this art of sifting, meaning taking a list of people, a list of names, and using the telephone or going out into the field and using the first touch as a means of separating out the buyers from the non-buyers, things dramatically change. Why? Because they don't waste time, their confidence starts to grow as they are only making presentations to those people that have the ability to buy, and it starts to feed on itself and feed on itself before you know it, you have someone that's well on the way to becoming a top producer. Bottom line, all right? So with that, let's get right to it. When you're out there on the phone or in the field, let's go for the phone first, right? I am telling you, you better be 
making yourself into a dialing machine because sales at the end of the day is a numbers game. The more times you dial the phone, the more people you'll speak to, the more times you get to actually do this sifting process of who's right and who's not right. I want you to be dialing the phone at least a couple of hundred times a day when you're first getting started. I want you to be a dialing machine, okay? When you're out there knocking on doors, depending on if you're knocking on businesses or homes, whatever it might be, I want you knocking on a hundred plus doors a day. All right, and we'll get to that separately. Here's the deal. Let's stick with the phone just for the rest of this right now because it's just easy for you to comprehend. You just choose one, they're very much the same, right? Of a hundred people that you call, no matter how targeted the campaign is, you're always going to find that they fall into four distinct categories. Now, I go through these in intimate detail in the straight line training, right? But I want to give you sort of an overview right now and the context of how you should be looking at it when you actually go through this, if you haven't gone through it already. So it starts with the first group. We call them buyers in heat. And these are your best buyers of all. Buyers need the people that need your product, want your product, can afford your product, mean have the financial ability to buy it, right? Buyers in heat. And here's one more thing about buyers in heat. This is what makes them buyers in heat. Is they're feeling some pain, some lack in terms of them wanting to make the decision now. Something is happening in their life that's making them feel an immediate need in the moment to buy the product now. Here's an example. Let's say you're an automobile salesman and someone walks in your dealership and it's a guy. And I'll use an old cliched example. And the guy just went on a date with a girl and the girl gets in his car and she's like, ew, this car is disgusting and gross. It's smelly. It's old. And not so much that she's a gold digger. I don't mean it like that, but like it's such a jalopy and it's a reflection of the person himself. It's like disgusting and it breaks down halfway through the date, right? And they get stuck, right? She leaves him and she's like, well, thanks, you know, thanks for the great day. You know, like, don't call me until you get a real car. Like, you know, I'm not asking for a Rolls Royce, but that guy now, the next day is a buyer in heat for a car. He is feeling pain about making a decision, right? That's your best buyer of all. They need your product. They want your product and they're feeling some pain about the product. I just had it the other day myself with, with a tooth of mine. I had a, 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 a tooth go bad on me, right? I went to the dentist, even the, in, in the service, like a medical profession, right? I walked into the dentist, I was in pain. She was like trying to explain, the tooth costs 2,000. I'm just fucking, yes, yes, just do it. I'm like, I don't care, she shows all the medications. She was like, fine, give me the medication. Like she could have said anything at that point because I'm feeling pain out of control. I wanna resolve that pain now. I'm a buyer in heat. That's your best buyer of all. The only problem with buyers is that the fewest in number. So out of 100 people in a pipeline, you might have 20 that are buyers in heat. Okay? Next group are called buyers in power, and they're very much like buyers in heat. They need your product. They want your product. They can benefit from your product. They can afford your product. Only difference is they're not feeling any pain, any urgency to buy the product now. You get it? So the example using a car would be a guy has a nice car right now and you know he knows it's four years old and maybe it's time to trade. And he's made a decision, you know, I'm gonna buy a new car. And he goes out there and starts shopping for a new car. But there's nothing driving him to make that decision that day. So in order to get that person to buy, you're gonna have to hit it like kind of right on the head, like show him exactly what he wants, make a very strong case, create some urgency about why it makes sense to do it right at that moment. So that buyer is definitely closable, but they're not as much of a lay down, so to speak, as a buyer in heat. Your buyers in heat are your best buyers of all. Unfortunately, there are fewer buyers in heat, there are buyers in power. So let's say there's 20 buyers in heat you might have 40 buyers in power or 30 buyers in power, right? So let's stick with the 40 numbers. That made 20 and 40, 60. Well, what does that mean? There's 40 people in two other categories, right? There's four categories at all. The next two categories are your non-buyers. So watch, category one, buyers in heat. Category two, buyers in power. Those two categories collectively are your potential prospective 
buyers. The remaining 40, and again, I'm just estimating numbers here, because that, that number or those numbers will be dependent on the quality of what? Of the marketing campaign. The more targeted the campaign, the more buyers that you'll have in there. You get it? The less targeted, the more people there will not be in that buyer's category. So these next two numbers are called, next two categories are called, you have what's called the looky lose or in other words, tire kickers. Looky loos are people that disguise themselves as buyers in power. They walk in, they act like they need the product, they want the product, they give you all the buy signals that a regular buyer in power, or he mostly, they usually, it's usually a buyer in power. So they, they, they're pretending like, yeah, I'm really interested, but you know, sell me this product. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not dying for it, right? That's your typical looky loo. But the one distinction is they have no intention of actually buying your product. And nine out of 10 times what separates the looky loos from a real buyer in power is money. They can't afford it. They're window shopping. They're getting some vicarious thrill about walking around pretending they can afford something. Maybe they want to test drive a car, trying on some clothing, using a computer and whatever it might be, just you know, finding out and pretending and people just like to shop, right? So those looky loos or tire kickers, and we call them tire kickers in the auto, right? Because they come in and kick the tires we never buy, right? The reason they're the most destructive buyers of all, or most destructive you know, non-buyers is because they waste your time. Those are the time vampires. You sit there because you might think they're buyers in power, you spend the time making a full-blown presentation and then you're following up on them and you're trying to close them, but they have no intention of buying. So we have to weed out those looky loos as quickly as possible. And in the actual training, I give you all the secrets of how to do that. So just to be clear, you're going to learn exactly how in a very step-by-step -step templated fashion here. But let me first get on now to this fourth category, which are called the mistakes or the people who are dragged into your pipeline. For example, very often when you run an online campaign, people will click something thinking it's something else. They go in, they click, they enter their email to try to opt in. They look, oh, forget, now nah, I'm not interested. Now you have that name and you try to call that person back. And the second that you call them, like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not interested, it's not for me. That's easy to identify, so they're not that dangerous. The thing I urge you to do though is do not try to turn these people who are not interested into buyers. You know, it's one of these things if you know, if they're not interested, I don't want to get into the whole Grant Cardone idiocy with it, you know, where I had, you've probably seen the, my Grant Cardone podcast where he died, I mean, he's, he's out of his mind, right? But anyway, the point is, is that when someone is not interested, that means they're not interested. As a, as a salesman, a professional salesman, your job is not to take people who are not interested in what you have and somehow pressure them and trick them into buying it. That's not what we do. What a professional salesperson does is we sift through a prospective list of buyers, that hundred list, hundred person strong list of buyers, and then we look for the buyers in those first two categories, buyers in power, buyers in heat and we continue to move them down the straight line so we're only making full-blown presentations to the people who can potentially buy our product now what happens to the looky loos and the mistakes well the mistakes are very easy to spot out they have no interest they'll tell you they have no interest and you say great sorry you waste them. have a great day click next the looky lose, you're gonna learn how to weed them out. You'll get better and better at it because there's some telltale signs which you'll go through in the training. But just remember, when you are out there calling people on the phone and there are 60 people that are in those first two categories, buyers in heat, buyers in power, you're not gonna close all 60. You're just not, I don't. Even the, the best closer in the world, so to speak, right? I'm not going to get all 60. When I say that I can teach you to close anyone who's closable, what I mean is that when you go through this list of 100 people 
and you weed out the 40 looky-loos and, and the stakes, right? And you're left with the 60 prospective buyers. The ones that don't buy from you, let's say you close 30 of them or 25 of them, what you're going to walk away saying to yourself is, you know what? I didn't close them, but no one could have closed them. JB himself wouldn't have closed them. And you'll know when you feel that way, you'll know that, wow, you know, if I do the work, if I make the dials, well, I'm definitely going to get the result. I'm going to get rich because I know that when I get a prospective buy that's closable, I'm not going to blow it. I say, I couldn't imagine, this is almost the whole idea of this program is to make sure that when you show up for your job and you start working, you start dialing or, or knocking on doors or seeing people in person, when you do that, you're not in the position where you say, well, I don't really know how to close people. Like, even if I do the work, even if I make the calls, I still can't close them. So you say, why would I want to even make all those calls? Your brain says it's not worth all the effort. So the, the, what this program does is it puts you in the position where when you exit and start at the company, you have the internal fortitude and the knowledge that, you know what, when I get someone on the phone that's qualified, I possess all the skills necessary to close them. And that is what sets you on the road to being a top producer, bottom line. And you get better and better with practice and repetition and so forth. That's the secret to the system. Why salespeople that graduate from this boot camp and go to a company, they outperform the people who just were recruited in some random way. And by the way, you'll notice that they stop, you know, the company stopped recruiting the random way because they don't get the same result as with us, right? The point is you'll hear stories about salesmen used to show up and their attrition rate was like 80%. This program, there is no attrition. Why? Because A, you're handpicked, and B, you're getting spoon-fed everything that you need to be able to close anyone who's closable. You get it? So when you hang up the phone and you haven't made a sale, you're like, you know what, that's okay. No one could have closed them. You don't say, oh, damn, I blew it. What's wrong with me? And that's power.